Our uh, reading of God's word for this morning comes from John chapter 3, and we're going to be starting at verse 27. To this, John replied, A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater, and I must become less. This is the word of the Lord. You can have a seat if you'd like. And then if you would all join me in a word of prayer as we prepare for our message here this morning. Lord God, we ask that you would bless your word here today. As we talk about humility, or as we talk about who we are and who you are, we, open, we pray that you would open our eyes to the truth and see that though we are great sinners, Lord, your ability to save is so much greater. And Lord, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, the reading that you just heard this morning is uh, it's the response that John the Baptist gives to his disciples when they came to him a little bit concerned about Jesus' ministry becoming too big. Jesus' ministry was starting to overshadow that of John, and his disciples were worried about it. They were concerned that this was happening. And so John responds to them, and in that response, we see an example of true humility. His focus was not on himself, but was on the one who had called him and the one to whom he had been called, uh, called to proclaim. And so we're going to talk about humility this morning. I don't know about you, but for me, that can sometimes be lacking. And so we're going to dive in and we're going to talk about that this morning a little bit. But first, I want to jump back a little further in chapter 3 of, of John here. And it says this, After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside, where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. So in chapter 2 of John, we heard that Jesus had come to the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. This was the big feast, the biggest celebration that the Jews celebrated every year. And he spent some time in the city there, but now he moves out into the countryside around the city to conduct some ministry. And specifically, we hear about baptism here. And we're told that the ministries of John and Jesus are overlapping. They're, they're sharing the same message and they're doing it at the same time and, and in the same general place. And this leads to an argument. First, there's an argument between John's disciples and some Jews who were there. These might have been some Jewish leaders or maybe just some devout members of the Jewish religion, but they're arguing with John's disciples about ceremonial washing. We, we don't get to hear exactly what was said, but I imagine there may have been something like, why is your baptism any different than all of the washings that we already have? Why is yours better? Why do we need yours when we have already have all of these? But I also think they may have said something like, and now there's this guy Jesus on the scene, and everybody's starting to go to him to be baptized. Is his baptism now greater than John's? Is his baptism greater than the one of your teacher? And the reason I think this came up is because when John's disciples came to him, and we heard about that, he says, look, the man who was with you, he's baptizing and everyone is going to him. I can sense maybe a little bit of pride or resentment. They don't, first of all, they don't even address Jesus by his name. They just say that man, you know, that guy that was with you, whoever he was. Yeah, everybody's going to him now. And they kind of throw in that everybody uh, do any of you ever do that? You exaggerate the situation when you're a little bit frustrated. I, you know, I, I deal with this with my kids. You know, I tell them you can't watch a movie today, and they say, oh, you mean we can never watch TV ever again? I'm like, no, that's not what I said. Or, you know, maybe one morning it was blueberry pancakes instead of chocolate chip, and now the entire day is ruined. Everything is horrible now. 
because we didn't have the right pancakes or or we do it too I do it too maybe my wife does something I don't appreciate I say why do you always have to do that right we we exaggerate when we're upset or frustrated about something and and that's what John's disciples are doing here but John's response which we heard in our reading again gives a powerful example and a, a reminder to us about humility He says, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater and I must become less. I think John could see the pride and resentment that his disciples were showing, and he recognized that those things are the ultimate tender for starting a fire. But what John also recognized is that humility is the ultimate fire extinguisher, right? You you want to bring a, a conflict to an end quickly? Try giving a genuine apology, right? Try taking ownership for your contribution to the situation. Try saying to the other person, how can I serve you in this situation? Can you help me to see where I have gone wrong here? If you take the fuel and the oxygen away from a fire, it's going to die quickly. But if you want to see a fire get out of control, uh, maybe stubbornly insist on getting your way. You know, point out the fault of the other person with, without considering your part in the issue. Maybe brood over your hurt feelings, right? You hurt me, so now I'm going to hurt you. And then you can sit back and, and watch that relationship and really anything good that it might have accomplished kind of go up in flames, right? Those pride and resentment, selfishness, those are the ultimate tinder for starting fires, but humility is the ultimate fire extinguisher. A few months back, my wife and I were doing some research on home appliances. And I don't know about all of you, but there are times when my wife and I don't see eye to eye. You know, imagine that. That happens sometimes. And and I'll tell you, she was on this end of things, and I was all the way over here. And none of us really felt much like compromising in that moment. So there were arguments, and things were said that, that shouldn't have been said. And pretty soon, we, we found ourselves in that situation of... I love you, but I don't have to like you right now. And, and just for the record, just so there's no confusion, I really don't like you right now, right? That's, that's where we had found ourselves. And some of you sound like maybe you've been there before too, so not alone, that's good. Um, and the other issue with that was we had sent the kids to the grandparents for, for the weekend or something. And so we had all these plans for that kid's free time to be, you know, getting some projects done around the house, you know, enjoy some uninterrupted meals together. But that was kind of ruined because of our attitudes toward each other in that moment. I remember one morning we were sitting there for breakfast and I'm not sure how it happened, but I think we both realized we needed some help. And so we started devotion. Uh, I can assure you my heart was not in it. I was just kind of going through the motions. Um, But part of why I tell that story is because I'm still a little bit overwhelmed with the way God had come in and changed my heart in that moment. Over the course of maybe an hour of, of reading his word, praying, and spending time discussing what we were reading, he came in and he, he changed my heart. He, he became greater in that moment and I became less because all that I was bringing, all that we were bringing to the table was our pride and our selfishness, our resentment, our hurt feelings. But Jesus, just like he always does and always can, he brought his grace and his mercy, his forgiveness, and he brought that ultimate fire extinguisher that was humility. And I know that there are bigger issues than arguments over appliances right here and right now in Grace Hill Church. It doesn't always, you know, one devotion doesn't always fix everything, but the principle remains we need to become less so that he can become greater. We, we all have those times where we think we are right all the time. We, we all have times where we view ourselves as better than others. We all have times where we contribute to arguments and conflicts. And so our question for today is, how do we grow in humility? I think we all recognize that we need more of it, but how do we grow in it? Well, how did John exhibit such great humility? 
I mean, remember, John, uh, Jesus himself has said that of men born of women, John is the greatest. You know, we, we read here that John himself had disciples. He had guys that devoted their life to just following him around and hearing every word that he said. He has the, the Jewish leaders of the day coming out to the desert and saying, you know, what are you up to out here? And he's kind of a big deal, and he could have gotten a big head over that, but he doesn't. He maintains this humility, and I think our reading gives us some reasons for why he was able to maintain this humility. I think first and foremost, John had a deep sense of who he was, and he had a, a deep sense of who Jesus was and still is today. In verse 8, he makes the point that I'm not the Christ. You know, I'm, I'm sent ahead of him. I'm just a messenger. He said before that I'm not even worthy to untie the sandals that are on Jesus' feet. In verse 29, he uses this analogy of a wedding, and he says, look, I'm not the bride. I'm not the groom. I'm just a groomsman. And not only, he doesn't just begrudgingly take that role either. He cannot wait for the bridegroom to get there. Even though that means that he's going to be overshadowed and lose his central place, he awaits with joy, it tells us. And then verse 30, we heard that powerful phrase again, John needed to become less prominent and Jesus needed to become more prominent. And he also recognized who Jesus was. We pick up our reading in verse 31. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has, accept, has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives the spirit without limit. The father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the son will not see life. For God's wrath remains on him. Jesus is the one who came from heaven. He is above all. He is the only one that can speak of what awaits us because he has experienced it. He has been there. Jesus has had all things placed in his hands. He's the son of God, the only way to salvation and eternal life. John knew who he was. He knew who Jesus was. How about you? Do you recognize who you are and do you recognize who Jesus is in your life? I speak for myself, and I, Scripture makes it clear that I speak for everyone when I say this. We are all sinners. Psalm 14 tells us this. The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Just in case you and I were convinced that maybe we're one of the few that, we're one of the good ones, right? We're one of the few that does good. Psalm 14 comes in and makes it clear that no, none of us are good in and of ourselves. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned, all fall short. No matter how you translate that, all means all. And not only are we sinners, but we also have no way to save ourselves, no way to clean ourselves up. But luckily, that's not the end of the story. Luckily, Romans chapter 3 has a verse 24 and doesn't stop at 23. And it says there that, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. We may be infected with this sickness that is sin, but through faith in Jesus Christ, we have access to the cure. He has done it for us. We don't have to do it ourselves. And that's who he is. He is our savior. He's the only one who's ever been good. The only one who has kept God's law to its fullest. He's true God and true man. He's the king of all things. All creation was created through him and the father has placed all things under him. And pastor told us last week as he went through that famous verse, John 3, 16, he told us of the incredibly deep love that Jesus has for us and that that drove him to the cross to die for us, that we would be redeemed. When, when we see this comparison of who we are and who Jesus is, 
I want to make the argument that the only logical response is one of humility. That if we lack humility, then we have made an error somewhere along the way. Either we have overestimated ourselves, we've lost sight of who we truly are, or we have underestimated God, we've lost sight of who he truly is, or maybe we've even done a little bit of both at the same time. But when we lack that humility, somewhere along the way, we've made a mistake. So, so you and I, we need to honestly assess who we are and who he is. Secondly, I think John recognized who it was all about, and he knew that it wasn't all about him, just like it isn't all about us. He was a supporting character. Jesus is the one playing the main role. When we insist on trying to be the, the central figure in our lives, we run into problems. Verse 23 or verse 27, that's the beginning of this passage, told us that a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You and I have no claim on anything in our own lives. We are all just benefactors of the one true God. James chapter 1, 17 tells us this, every good gift, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. There is nothing in our lives that we can lay claim to. Nothing that you or I can point to and say, look at that, I earned that, or look at that, that was all me. Because it just isn't true. We're recipients of God's good gifts, and this, is also, this also applies to the ministry that we are called into. We're all called into ministry in some way. John recognized that this ministry was not about him, but rather was all about pointing to Jesus and do we always recognize that? Are, are we sometimes in danger of getting things mixed up, of thinking that the ministry is all about us? Are we in danger of seeing good things happening and, and making the mistake of thinking that all that good stuff is because of what we have done? You know, Grace Hill is a wonderful place. I, I love it here. But at the end of the day, ministry is about helping bring souls to God's family, not just to, to Grace Hill's family. As we start thinking about building buildings and getting the message about, out about who Grace Hill is, it's important to remember that we're called to, first of all, get the message out about who Jesus is. This is about the gospel message being shared, not just about Grace, the Grace Hill brand being built up. But again, don't get me wrong. Grace Hill has been an amazing place for, for my own faith, for the faith of my family, for many families who have walked through those doors. And as we welcome more people in, that is our way to share that gospel message with more people. But I just encourage us, let's continue to be watchful for hearts that might make the same mistake that John's disciples did. They were concerned. They were afraid that Jesus was going to overshadow them and their teacher. But that was the whole point. Jesus needed to become greater and they needed to become less and the same is true for us. I think the last thing here that helped John have this sense of humility is that he recognized that the message of Christ Jesus was for everyone. It wasn't just for the religious elite. It wasn't just for those that the world gives the highest status. You know, so at the beginning of our reading, we saw that Jesus and John, they were baptizing out in the countryside rather than in the city center. Out in the countryside, that's where they're going to come in contact with the humble and, and the lowly people of that day. And they did that because they recognized that the message was for everyone, not just the religious elite, not just for the self-righteous of that day. How many of us sometimes get into thinking that we deserve the gospel message more than others? We start thinking that the message is for us because we're in the church. Those out there, those, the real sinners out there, they don't deserve God's mercy as much as we do. We might say, you know, I've, I've done the works to get myself right with God. I deserve that message. They don't. But that is not how God sees it. That's not the truth. John recognized that the gospel message was for everyone equally. No one had any greater claim to God's grace than anyone else, whether they were in the church or outside the church, whether they were the CEO or the janitor, whether they were a free man or a prisoner, the drug, the drug addict, the adulterer, the rich and the famous or the poor and the homeless. 
we're all in the same boat. Everyone, the message of the gospel is for everyone because everyone desperately needs it. We're, we're all big time sinners until we grasp the magnitude of how much we have been forgiven, we're never going to understand how much Jesus did for us, how great this gift of Jesus truly is till we recognize the depth of our sin. And that message is for everyone, regardless of, regardless of how the world may want to assign status. John the Baptist showed great humility in how he responded to this event of Jesus' ministry starting to overshadow his own. And, and he did this by recognizing who he was and recognizing who Jesus was and still is. He, he did this by recognizing that the ministry was not his. It was not about him, but that Jesus was always to be the focus. And he did this by seeing that the gospel message was meant for everyone. He knew that no matter what, Jesus needed to become greater and he himself needed to become less. And you and I need to do the same thing. We, we need to realize that we aren't even the main characters of our own lives. Jesus is the central figure even of our lives because he's the one doing great things. He's the one that brings us from death to life. He's the one that assures us of a future. Let's let him be greater and let's allow ourselves to become less. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking that you would please have mercy on us. Lord, we have been anything but humble. We have failed to show humility towards you, and we have failed to show humility towards others. Lord, we have constantly insisted on our own way, and we have constantly insisted that everything is all about us. Let us now confess before you, Lord, our sin and our need for you to be our Savior. Lord, please open our eyes to see the truth of who you are and the truth of who we are. Lord, that though our sin is great, your love and your mercy are so much greater. And Lord, guide us in living a life of humility before you and before those around us, that you and your holy name may be glorified. Amen. None of us has ever done anything to earn God's grace. None of us has ever done anything deserving of his mercy. We can't point to anything in our lives and say, that right there, because of that, God owes me this forgiveness. We're all sinners who are lost, but through God's grace and mercy, he has given forgiveness to all who believe. The, the ground at the foot of the cross is completely level. There is no one higher than anyone else. We all are beggars before the king, and we all receive his mercy through his free gift, through his great generosity that he has given us that. This, this is a humbling message, and, and it should humble us, but it's also a joyful message. We don't have to earn our way to God. And that's the wonderful gospel message that we get to share today and, and every day. And I encourage you to do that. And I pray that as you leave here today, that you would understand and that you would know for certain that you have been forgiven of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.